Bat and the Waiting Game, Chapter 19, Social Animals. It is not easy to teach a baby skunk to stay or to sit or to roll over, but Bat and Israel discovered that Thor could learn one trick, come. When Israel pointed Thor in Bat's direction and Bat said in his sweetest voice, Thor, baby, Thor, come here, baby, Thor. The skunk kit's nose quivered and his feet scuttled clumsily along the ground and his growing black and white tail followed behind him as he made his way across the distance between the two boys. You're the smartest skunk kit in the whole world, Bat cooed to Thor, scooping him up and kissing his nose, the top of his head, his fuzzy little paws, when Thor was tired of playing cum anymore. Bad and Israel fed him a snack of soft bread and wet dog food and watched as he ate it and licked his whiskers. Then he retreated to his nest in the kitty carrier, scratched around for a few minutes, and disappeared into silence. Bad and Israel sat on Ben's railroad rug, just outside of Thor's playpen, eating the last snack before bedtime, a bowl of popcorn Mom had brought them. She made it in the air popper and had poured melted butter over, and sprinkled salt on top. It's great how big Thor is getting, Israel said, crunching a mouthful of popcorn. How long until he'll, he'll be ready to release? The question made Bat's stomach feel queasy. He dropped his handful of popcorn back into the bowl. Not for a long time, he said. He's still barely a toddler. You wouldn't send a toddler out into the cold night all alone, would you? Right, Israel said. I know not now, but just how long do you think? A month? A year? How long do you get to keep him? That's a stupid question, Bat said. He stood up and brushed the popcorn crumbs off of his pajamas. Why is it stupid? Israel asked. He was still sitting on the rug, still eating popcorn. Because it is stupid, Bat yelled. Actually, he knew it wasn't a stupid question. It was the same question Bat asked himself over and over every day. He asked it over and over because he didn't like the answer and kept hoping for a different one. The real answer was that Thor could stay with them until the end of summer, when he would be nearly full grown and able to forage for food on his own. Then they would have to release him into the wild. You know, Bat, Israel said, sometimes you could be nicer. How could it be that just a few minutes ago, Bat had been telling Israel that he was Bat's best friend, and now Israel was telling Bat that he wasn't nice? Everything felt great, and now everything felt horrible. There was a knock on the door, and Mom poked her head in. Boys, she said, it's time to brush teeth and climb into bed. Okay, Dr. Tam, Israel said, and he got up and headed towards the bathroom. From the living room, Bat heard the happy laughter of Janie and her friends. It wasn't fair, he thought. Mom, Bat said, Janie is a social butterfly, and I'm a social frog. Oh, baby. Mom didn't ask what had happened. She just stood in, next to Bat and put her arms around him, letting him take a step into her before she squeezed him tight. It's late and you're tired, she said. Things will look better in the morning. Things are always brighter when the sun comes up. For butterflies and for frogs. Chapter 20. Pot Throwing The sleepover ended at noon the next day, when the last of Janie's friends was picked up by her mother. See ya, Bat, said Frida. Thank you, Janie. Thank you, Dr. Tam. The first kid to leave had been Israel. His parents had to pick him up early because they were taking a load of Cora's pottery to the farmer's market to sell, which they did every few months, and Israel had to help. It was fun, he said to Bat before he left, but Bat couldn't tell that if it was the truth or not. Bat was still embarrassed about how he had yelled at Israel the night before, but he didn't like to apologize. Anyway, Israel shouldn't have kept pushing him about when they were going to release Thor into the wild. And the next day, a dreary, drizzly sort of day, Israel didn't come to school. Maybe he's sick, Mom said. There's a cold going around. She called Israel's house to find out. And sure enough, she found out that Israel had been under the weather. That's a funny expression, Bat said. His voice felt sort of high and tight. Because you really can't be under the weather or over the weather. 
You can only be in the weather or out of the weather, don't you think? I think, Mom said, resting one gentle hand on Bat's shoulder. Think that maybe you're still upset about fighting with Israel this weekend. Do you want to talk about it? I want to know what the weather will be like for the rest of the week, Bat said, rolling up onto the balls of his feet. You want to know whether the weather will be warm? Mom said, squeezing Bat's shoulder. Yes, Bat said, glad that Mom wasn't going to make him talk about Israel. Israel was back in school the next day, but he told Bat he didn't feel well enough to do anything together when they got back to his house. He disappeared into his bedroom, leaving Bat in the kitchen with Tom. I've got an idea, Tom said. How about we get our hands dirty? Bat was not a big fan of dirty hands, but he didn't feel like saying no to Tom, so he followed him out the back door across the yard under a sky dappled with gray clouds and into Cora's shed. Cora was there, wrapping a vase with a thick swaddle of newspaper. This one is on its way to Vermont, she told them. I just sold it. Great, said Tom. Then, want to introduce Ben Bat to the joys of pot throwing? For a minute, Bat imagined the three of them picking up the pots from their shelves and throwing them against the walls, hearing them shatter in his imagination. Cora must have seen the concern on his face because she quickly said, Throwing a pot is just another way of saying making a pot on the wheel. It's fun, even if it's sort of sticky and slimy. Do you want to try? Actually, Bat would have preferred to go home or go to Bat or Mom's vet clinic or even back to Mr. Grayson's classroom. But he couldn't go any of those places. Not right now. He had to wait. So he sat down at the potter's wheel. Okay, he said. Outstanding, said Tom. First, the clay. First the clay, Cora repeated, and she brought out a large plastic wrapped cube of clay from under the counter. She peeled back the plastic and picked up a piece of wire with a wooden handle attached to each end. She held the wire against the cube and pulled it back, through shaving a layer off of clay. She set it aside and wrapped the cube in plastic. Then she held out the clay to bat. Squish it into a ball, she said. Squeeze it hard to get all, out all the air bubbles. Bat hesitated, but finally he held out his hand and let Cora place the clay into it. It was cool, almost cold and damp. He folded it into his hands and squeezed, forming a rough ball. His hands turned, in, turned a dusty gray that dried to white. He squeezed and squeezed. Great, I, great, said Tom. Now slam it down hard. Just throw it down, right there, on the wheel. Bat did it. Flat went the clay against the wheel, flattening out in a satisfying way. Again, said Cora. So Bat picked up the clay and reformed it into a ball. After he threw it a second time, Tom took a turn throwing and shaping it. And then Cora pronounced it ready. Okay, said Cora, throw it one more time. And this time, try to aim it right for the center of the wheel. Bat threw the clay. Perfect, Cora said. Now Tom will keep the wheel spinning so you don't have to worry about that. I'll help you keep the clay wet. You just cup your hands around the clay, gently but firmly, like you're holding on to something precious, okay? I'll pretend I'm holding Thor, Bat said, my skunk kit. Great idea, Cora said. Ready? Bat nodded. He cupped his hands around the clay lump. Beside him, Tom stepped gently on the foot of the pedal, and the wheel began to spin. Cora took a cup of water and poured it slowly and poured it in a slow, steady stream over Bat's hands and onto the clay. Good, said Cora. Push the clay down and in. Down and in. Don't worry if it squishes through your fingers. That's fine. Wet clay oozed between each of Bat's fingers, and it was a gooey feeling. But not bad. Kind of interesting, actually. Bat watched the clay spinning, spinning in fast little circles. He watched the clay pushing out of his fingers. He felt almost hypnotized by the sensation of the slippery wet clay in his hands, spinning, spinning. The challenge of holding it just right in between his fingers and thumbs, not too loosely or it would wobble out of control, not too tightly or the emerging bowl would smush on the side. But then he could feel the, begin the clay beginning to shift off center. It was falling to the side, and he was trying to push it back into the center of the wheel, 
but it seemed like the harder he pushed, the worse it got. And the clay wasn't a ball anymore. It was a weird floppy tube, and it was twisting and falling. And then he yelled, it's breaking! And flicks of clay splattered his face. Tom took his foot off the pedal, and the wheel slowed and stopped. You did it! He said, grinning. No, I didn't, Bat said. I made a mess. Mess is the beginning of art, Cora said. She was smiling, too. Do you want to try again? Yes, Bat said. Yes, please. Before Bat went home, he peeked his head into Israel's room, hoping to tell Israel about how he'd learned to make a bowl and about how it wasn't perfectly symmetrical, but it was still recognizable as a bowl and how Cora had called it creatively cattywampus. Maybe he could even say something to let Israel know that he felt bad about their fight. But Israel was in his bed, his covers pulled up over his chin, his eyes closed. Working with the potter's wheel had made Bat feel so good, and he really wanted to tell Israel about it. He almost went over to Israel's bed to see if he was really asleep or just resting. But then Tom called, Bat, your mom is here! Bat hesitated, looking at the sweaty curls on Israel's forehead. Then, quietly, he backed out of Israel's room, feeling sort of lonely and disappointed that he wouldn't be able to say goodbye.